Welcome to Heart to Heart with Anna, featuring your host, Anna Jaworski. Our program is a program designed to empower the CHD or congenital heart defect community. Our program may also help families who have children who are chronically ill by bringing information and encouragement to you in order to become an advocate for your community. Now, here is Anna Jaworski. Welcome to Heart to Heart with Anna. I am Anna Jaworski and a host of Heart to Heart with Anna. This is the sixth episode of season seven of Heart to Heart with Anna. Our theme this season is Congenital Heart Defects Around the Globe, and today's show is CHDs Around the Globe, Germany. I am so excited to have this guest on my show. I met Debbie in person years ago, but we met first online thanks to a project that I was working on. It was a book project called The Heart of a Mother. I was told by a friend of mine that this wonderful author had put together a beautiful piece commemorating her son. And she said, oh, you have to get in touch with this woman. And so that was how I was introduced to Debbie Gilmore. And she and I have been fast friends ever since. Debbie Gilmore is a wife and full-time mother to her heart angel, Matthew Michael Gilmore, and his brother, Brandon James Gilmore, now 18 years old. Debbie had an uneventful pregnancy and worked up until the day she delivered Matthew. She loved being pregnant and loved the delivery even more. Little did she know that the next day her life would be transformed into a living nightmare with acronyms like CHD, DORV, and TOF. This was one roller coaster ride she wasn't sure she could survive. Debbie is also a published author. Her first published work was My Candle in the Wind, a beautiful essay about her son Matthew in the book, The Heart of a Mother. Since then, Debbie has had a number of other pieces published, including an essay in Chicken Soup for the Mother's Soul 2 and other publications. Debbie lives in Germany with her rainbow baby, Brandon, and her husband, Eugene, in the very beautiful city of Kaiserslautern. Welcome to Heart to Heart with Anna, Debbie. Thank you, Anna. It's nice to be here today. Well, I'm so happy to have you on this show, and I'm excited to be talking to you all the way from Germany. You're the first person to come on the show from Europe, Debbie. Wow. <laughs> well, let's start by talking about how in the world you ended up in Germany. Well, Anna, I was young and struggling to make ends meet when my father told me it might be a good idea to join the military. So I did that. And when I got in, I realized I could travel the world on their dime and be able to see what was going on. So after two years, I put in for a transfer over here to Germany, and I received it. And that's how I ended up in Germany. So you are an American citizen then. Where were you from in America? I'm from Kansas City, Missouri, and lived there for 25 years of my life. And I've lived over here now for almost 26 that's amazing. I'm ready for you to be back in the States. So. <laughs> Not as much as I'm ready to be there. <laughs> I can't wait. Well, we'll be talking more about that later. But for now, I want you to tell me about working full time while you were pregnant with Matthew. So you were in the military when you were pregnant with Matthew? No, I wasn't in the military. I had gotten out of the military. I had met my husband over here and we had gotten married and I was just working for the base in a civilian position. Oh, okay. Okay. So then you were living on the German economy. Yes, I was living on the German economy when I got pregnant with Matthew. That must have been a huge change for you to go from being in Kansas City to all of a sudden being in Germany and living on the German economy and getting pregnant. What was the health care like over there? Well, the health care was pretty much automatic because my husband had private insurance here in Germany. So when Matthew was born, he was automatically included onto my husband's policy. So that wasn't really a big thing. Actually, I was on the military installation when I was pregnant. So I had access to American doctors. So that wasn't anything really totally different. When Matthew was born, though, and they found out he had a heart defect, then they wanted to ship us back to America right away. But we couldn't really go back to America because we lived here and we didn't have a house in America to go to. Right, right. Everything was there for you because your husband was from Germany. Okay, mm -hmm. so you had American doctors, but did you ever have an ultrasound? Did you find out ahead of time that Matthew would have a heart defect? Actually, I did have an ultrasound done by a German firm when I was pregnant, and they didn't see anything or they didn't alert me of anything unusual going on. What happened was when I had Matthew, the nurse in the nursery 
realized that there was a heart murmur going on there, and he wanted the doctors to check it out and see what was going on in more depth. They should have realized what happened when his umbilical cord only had two arteries instead of the normal three. Oh, wow. So they didn't pick up on that after he was born? No, apparently not. Later, they came back and said they should have noticed this because his umbilical cord only had the two arteries and not the three. But they didn't notice that at first. And it was a nurse in the nursery that actually recognized the heart murmur and decided to have him checked out further, which was a very good thing in the end run. Right, right. It's probably what saved his life, isn't it? Yes. I mean, he wasn't in any real imminent danger. He was diagnosed in the beginning with Tetralogy of Fallot. And those children can live for up to 5, 10, even 15 years sometimes without a lot of surgery interventions. But he he also had double outlet right ventricle. Well, that was what they diagnosed him with when we took him to the Aldo Castaneda Institute in Genolier, Switzerland. It was changed from Tetralogy of Fallot to double outlet right ventricle with a single VSD, severe pulmonary stenosis, left anterior descending right coronary artery, and that was the status post-left modified Baylock toxic shunt. Okay. That's a mouthful. (laughs) It is a mouthful. Oh my gosh, it is a mouthful. So it sounds like the diagnosis changed, which is not uncommon. We've had the same kind of situation happen with us as well, especially once they are able to look at the heart itself and see exactly what's going on. But we're going to learn more about that in the next segment. We do need to take a quick commercial break. So don't leave yet, friends, because we will be talking more about Matthew and the surgeries he's had and where he had to travel to get help. We'll be right back after this brief commercial break. Anna Jaworski has written several books to empower the congenital heart defect or CHD community. These books can be found at Amazon.com or at her website, www.amazon.com babyheartspress.com. Her bestseller is The Heart of a Mother, an anthology of stories written by women for women in the CHD community. Anna's other books, My Brother Needs an Operation, The Heart of a Father, and Hypoplastic Left Heart Syndrome, a handbook for parents, will help you understand that you are not alone. Visit babyheartspress.com to find out more. Welcome back to our show, Heart to Heart with Anna, a show for the congenital heart defect community. Today's show is CHDs Around the Globe, Germany, and we're talking with Debbie Gilmore from Kaiserslautern. I hope I'm pronouncing that right, Debbie. You know me and my German. It's not very good. (laughs) It's perfect. (laughs) Okay. Debbie is the mother to a heart angel, Matthew, and to a rainbow baby, Brandon, who is now 18 years old, and we're going to be talking a little bit more about those two wonderful boys. So, Debbie, first, I have to remember that Matthew was born, gosh, almost 20 years ago. That's just hard for me to believe that it's been that long because you and I have known each other since right after he passed away. Mm -hmm. And I know that healthcare was really different back then because I had a son 21 years ago. And I'm just wondering if you can tell me a little bit more about that first surgery. You did say before the break that he had a Blalock toxic shunt, but can you tell us a little bit more about what it was like when he was first diagnosed and what they decided to do with him? Yes. At first, like I said, he was diagnosed with Tetralogy of Fallot. And so in June of 1996, he had a valvuloplasty done in Kaiserslautern by Dr. Rupart. And that lasted all of one day. So then Professor Rupart said, don't worry about it. We're going to watch him and monitor his sats and things like that. And in August of 96, we decided that things were getting a little bit shaky. So we wanted to take him up to Bonn, Germany, which is the capital here in Germany. And they were going to do a Blalock toxic shunt. And they had to modify that due to the anomalous left arterial descending artery. And that was really a very shaky time for me and probably the worst part out of all of this because I was so unsure of what was going to happen that I would literally crawl up into a fetal ball and shake every night. And I was so lucky to have such a wonderful husband that got me through that. Yeah, it's so scary. Folks today don't really understand what you and I went through. 20 years ago, there was no internet like this. We didn't 
have the opportunity to really even reach out and find other people unless we were lucky enough that there was another mother there in the hospital at the same time. But it wasn't like it is today. We didn't have the open information that we do today. And it really, really was scary. And for you, you were having to travel away from home. First of all, you're at a country that's not your own country. We I don't up- speak the language. Yes, I was going to ask you that. So how did the doctor communicate with you? Well, thank goodness my husband is totally fluent in German, so he basically spoke to my husband, and I had to wait and get a translation from that. And the translation would be whatever my husband thought I needed to hear, most likely. (laughs) (laughs) uh, But all in all, it did work out, but it was very difficult. And one thing I found very interesting is in Germany, when we were in Bonn, for example, there were probably 12 to 14 babies in the nursery. We were very much on the internet, finding out what our child had, what was going on. And we'd ask these other mothers, what's wrong with your baby? And their basic reply was, he has a hole in his heart. Mm. And so I think that this is maybe a little bit what the doctors wanted. They don't want anybody to question them. The women said they have a hole in the heart and they didn't really understand what was going on. Right. Now, see, what our listeners don't know, but what you and I know is that Eugene, her husband, is an engineer. And Mm -hmm. he is the kind of person who wants to know everything about everything. So I could just imagine (laughs) being crazy trying to figure out exactly what was going on with Matthew. Oh, yes. Actually, when we were in Bonn, the doctor there was very surprised because he would do something to Matthew and then he would explain it to us. We would go back to the hotel room at night and Gene would look it all up on the internet and we'd go back in the next morning. And because of him being an electrical engineer, he knows about plumbing and things like that, which is very much like the heart. Mm -hmm. And so he would ask the doctor questions. The doctor would be like, are you a doctor? And my husband would, he was like, no, I'm not a doctor, he says, but I know what I'm talking about. And so it was very beneficial for me because my husband knew so much about it and could understand it and he could dumb it down for me so that I could understand it even better. Well, we're both lucky that way because my husband was a nurse and he had to do the same thing for me. (laughs) Yes. I mean, I was a teacher of the deaf. We assumed the kids' hearts were okay. I didn't have to know. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I just didn't have to know all the particulars about the heart to teach the children that I was working with. And I had already had a heart-healthy child. I wasn't expecting to have a child with a heart defect. And it sounds like you had a normal pregnancy. You had a normal delivery. It doesn't sound like you were prepared for this either. Oh, it was the last thing that I had expected. And then when it happened, I was just totally floored because... I didn't think things like that happened to me. Right. And or, or to I don't know what made you. <laughs> yes, exactly. I don't know what made me so special that it shouldn't happen, but it just goes to prove that it does happen to everybody. Nobody's immune to something like this happening. That's right. Nobody is immune. And that's why the show is so important, especially right now going all over the world. We see that this happens everywhere. This is not something that just happens in third world countries. This is happening everywhere. And it is the most common birth defect, even though most people don't realize that. So it's really important for us to spread awareness and let people know that they're not alone. I'm impressed that 20 years ago, Jean was able to find information on the internet because I really didn't start finding anything on the internet until Alex was two. So that was 19 years ago. And at that point, Debbie, almost exclusively, the websites that I found were memorials to Mm -hmm. babies. There wasn't a whole lot of information for parents. I know that Matthew's heart defect was complicated. I didn't realize quite how complicated it was until you and I started talking about doing the show together. But I realize now that he had the valvuloplasty and then he had a BT shunt. So he already had been through two surgeries. Then what were they going to do with him? I wanted an American doctor to do Matthew's surgery. And so we heard about Dr. Norwood, who was an American pioneer in the CHD surgeries, especially for the Norwood procedure, which Matthew didn't need. However, I felt that anybody that was that great and could come up with complex solutions to a very big problem would be a good person to have working with my son. At the time, he was working at the Aldo Castaneda Institute in Genolier, Switzerland. 
And so we called down there and asked for a consultation over the phone, and they told us that it was really important that the child be treated as soon as possible because in treating the heart defects sooner and making the changes that needed to be done, it saved the other organs from damage. And that made perfect sense to me. And Mm -hmm. My husband had a little bit of a different feeling, just a gut feeling that he really didn't want to go, but he couldn't say why. And I said, but the doctors are saying it's important to go now. So we went. It was a beautiful, beautiful place. And this comes back to the insurance thing. We had to fight to get Dr. Norwood to be able to do his surgery because the insurance didn't want to pay for it. And so we wrote Dr. Norwood and asked him what it would cost totally to have this surgery done for my son. And he told us it wouldn't cost more than 40,000 euros, which is about 43,000 US dollars. And so my husband took that information and went back to our insurance company and they said, okay, we will pay 40,000 euros and not one penny more. We were happy. We could go down there and at least that much would be covered. And we went down to Genolier and We had a room that had two adult beds and a crib in there so that we could all be together as a family. We proceeded to do this. However, I was seven months pregnant at the time. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. I never told you that before. (laughs) Well, I think you did, but I think it just has really struck me now how much you were going through. In preparing for the radio show, you and I communicated with each other, and I just didn't realize how compacted all of these situations were. I mean, I read your essay. It was in my book, and you talked about the roller coaster ride, but I guess it's just really struck me now how you were just going through one thing after another. You had just really recovered mentally or emotionally from Matthew being diagnosed, fighting for surgery for him, and then finding out you're pregnant. Now you're seven months pregnant and you're going to yet another country. You're going to Switzerland for surgery. Mm -hmm. And Debbie, you probably didn't really know 100% what you were going to face there either, did you? No, our greatest nightmare was that we were going to be coming home with an empty car seat. And unfortunately, that's exactly what happened. It just amazes me, though, the faith that you put in those doctors and how you were willing to fight the insurance and to go all that way. What is it that they decided to do and what went wrong? Well, the incidence of problems when you have a child that has a congenital heart defect, several things are already severely wrong. In my heart, I believe that the doctors and the nurses and everybody did everything that they possibly could for Matthew. They did everything that was physically possible. And sometimes things just aren't meant to be. There is a reason, I believe, that this happened in this way. And I believe that it is something that had to happen. So I don't place any blame on anyone. I think it's easier to live with myself that way, too. Basically, he had his surgery. And if you make it through the first 24, then you're usually okay. He made it 12 hours and they had to put him on ECMO. They weren't planning to have to do that. They didn't have ECMO ready, which could have been a problem. But I tend to think of it as this was just Matthew's journey and it's our journey too. My major concern was what was going to happen to Brandon, who was inside of me too. You know, I'm losing one son and I didn't want to lose both of them at the same time. Right, right. Absolutely. And for our listeners, especially our young listeners who maybe don't know the history of all of the apparatus that goes along with congenital heart surgery, ECMO was not common 20 years ago. It's much more common today than it was 20 years ago. So I'm sure the doctors weren't expecting he was going to need that. And ECMO stands for extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. And it's kind of a measure of last resort. I did do a whole show that talked about that. And we have had some miracles occur. But usually your child doesn't go in ECMO unless they are in dire circumstances. Right, Debbie? Exactly. Right. And also, Matthew was, like we found out, later with the other diagnosis from the Aldo Castaneda Institute, he was a very, very difficult case. I have to commend the doctors that are there. Matthew was actually the last operation they did in Genolier, and they moved to Nemours in Delaware and opened up a new cardiac wing, pediatric cardiac wing in Nemours. And 
Dr. Presario is still in Nemours, and Dr. Murphy and Dr. Norwood are no longer working there, but they were an amazing team. They were really an amazing team, and they supported us, and they were very gracious when this happened and treated us with that most dignity. And that's what's so important. You feel that they cared about your son. You feel that they did everything that they possibly could do. We had everybody from Dr. Norwood down to the cleaning people. We were there for 30 days, Anna, in the hospital. And they all came in. They all grieved with us. They all loved us and held us in their arms. I can't say enough. And it was an almost heavenly place to be. You looked outside. There were mountains and lakes all over the place. When we got down there, I made the strange comment. And I said, this place is like heaven. And... For my son, it was. Wow. Well, that's a beautiful image for us to go to another commercial break. Debbie, you have me in tears. <laughs> okay, we need to take another quick commercial break, but don't leave yet because when we come back, we're going to talk to Debbie about her rainbow baby and what her plans are for the future. Anna Jaworski has spoken around the world at congenital heart defect events, and she is available as a keynote or guest speaker for your event. Go to hearttoheartwithanna.com to learn more about booking Anna for your event. You can also find out more about the radio program. Keep up to date with CHD resources and information about advocacy groups, as well as read Anna's weekly blog. Anna wants you to stay well-connected and participate in the CHD community. Visit hearttoheartwithanna.com today. Welcome back to our show, Heart to Heart with Anna, a show for the congenital heart defect community. Today's show is CHD's Around the Globe Germany, and we're talking with Debbie Gilmore. Debbie is the mother to heart angel Matthew and rainbow baby Brandon. I feel funny calling him a rainbow baby because he's 18 years old. He's way bigger than I am now. <laughs> he's a big strapping young man, and she's talking to us from Kaiserslautern. And Debbie... You had me in tears at the end there because I love your family and it hurts me that you had to lose Matthew the way that you did. But I'm so happy for you that he went in such a peaceful place. That's what struck me about your essay in The Heart of a Mother was your story, My Candle in the Wind. Matthew was lost shortly after Princess Diana passed yes. away. And so and that song... Teresa. And Mother Teresa, right. And that song, Candle in the Wind, was all over the airwaves. And so it really did strike a chord with you, didn't it, Debbie? Oh, yes. Well, I remember sitting in the hospital room and I would be in the room and I'd have to go down and be with him in ICU because for almost 20 some odd days, he was on life support while we tried to make the decision what we had to do. And I was watching the funeral of Princess Di. I was watching the funeral from Mother Teresa. And I remember sitting in there going, okay, God, you took Princess Di and you took Mother Teresa. So you can leave Matthew with me, right? <laughs> and yeah. he didn't exactly agree. And then I'll never forget that when they took him out of the room, and of course, when someone dies, they cover them up. And that was really hard on me because I said, no, I want people to see my son. This is my son, and I want them to see him. Just because he died doesn't mean that you shouldn't look at him. That part was very hard. And the day we had to leave the hospital and leave him there, Genolier was so great. They made sure that he was flown home to my home state in Missouri. We didn't have to do anything, Anna. It was such a godsend because I don't know how we would have accomplished it. They flew him home to Missouri and got him to the funeral home where my mother and my father had been buried. And my brothers gave him a really wonderful police salute at the graveyard. So there was a lot of really wonderful things that came from this too. There were, and you were so at peace with what happened. That really struck me, Debbie, because finding that sense of peace after such a tremendous loss is very difficult for a lot of people. And yet I always got the feeling from you that you were thankful for the time you did have with Matthew, and you were so quick to find the beauty in the surroundings about you. You talked about how gorgeous Switzerland was, and you did talk about how it seemed almost like heaven on earth. And I never got the impression that you were bitter or angry about what happened to you. No, I was never bitter or angry. I was sad that I had to let him go. 
because I wanted him more than anything. That was my main goal in life was to have children and be a mother. That was the only thing I wanted to be. I quit work after I found out that he had a heart defect because I said I wanted to spend every moment with him. I didn't want to miss out on anything. I was comfortable with that because I had done everything I possibly could. There was nothing else I could have done that would have made his life better or our life better. And sometimes we're not always meant to have everything forever. Sometimes we're meant to let go. He brought a world of beauty into our life. He taught me more than any amount of education could have taught me. So I do have peace and I do believe I'll see him again. Oh, I know you will. I know you will. Well, Debbie, when you became pregnant with Brandon, you already had a diagnosis from Matthew. So did that mean that your second pregnancy was a high-risk pregnancy? It was a high-risk pregnancy, and I had a wonderful OBGYN, Dr. Vogt, who also took very good care of me. And when we went to Switzerland, I asked him, I said, can I have some tablets to keep me calm while I'm down there? And he says, Mrs. Gilmore, he says, you cling to your husband and the doctors and nurses down there, and you be strong. He says, you don't need medication. He says, women were walking around during the war and bombs were dropping. He says, you don't need medication. And long story short, I was given ultrasounds down in Genolier. They watched my blood pressure. They watched everything very closely. I was high-risk pregnancy, but everything worked out great. And when Brandon was born, the cardiologist from Matthew came over, Dr. Rupart, and checked him out right away. And we knew before Brandon was born that he had a healthy heart and that nothing was wrong there. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. And that's what we hope with our rainbow babies. We hope that they'll all be heart healthy. And we did do a whole show on rainbow babies. And that one had me crying too, Debbie. (laughs) (laughs) I can imagine. (laughs) Oh, Debbie. I can't believe how fast the time has gone, but I knew it would because you and I always get lost in time when we start talking to each other. But before we end the show, I'm wondering if you could give me just a couple pieces of advice for any woman who's in Germany who might be pregnant and have discovered she has a baby with a heart defect, or maybe she just gave birth to a baby with a heart defect. What advice do you have for that mother? To get on the internet, look up, research, and educate yourself. Know what you're dealing with so that when you go into the doctors, you can talk coherently and concisely with them. And if you don't understand, ask them. Most of them are really, really wonderful and will tell you whatever you need to know. I think that's really, really good advice. Okay, I lied. One more quick question. (laughs) (laughs) What are your plans for the future? When am I going to see you again, Debbie? Hopefully soon. We want to move back to the United States as soon as possible. But right now, I live by the adage, let go and let God. And I kind of let him guide me in my decisions in life. And I kind of let him take me where I need to be at the times I need to be there. So right now, we're just going to keep plugging along, trying to get back to the United States. And when the time is right, I'm sure he'll make a way for me to get there. Okay, I'm just hoping it's Texas that you end up in. You know that. I'm pulling for Texas. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, we'll, be, we'll keep that in mind, Anna. Okay, Debbie. I'd love to be close to you. Oh, I know. I would love it too, girl. We would, we'd spend a lot more time talking. <laughs> we probably get nothing done. <laughs> well, thanks so much for coming on the show, Debbie, and for sharing your experiences with us. And thank you for having me, Anna. It's been really, really great. We should talk like this more often. We do need to talk like this more often, that's for sure. Well, thanks for listening today, everybody. That concludes this episode of Heart to Heart with Anna. Please come back next week on Tuesday at noon Eastern time for a brand new episode. Find and like us on Facebook. Check out our website, hearttoheartwithanna.com and our Cafe Press Boutique. All of the proceeds from the purchases on the Cafe Press Boutique go to fund this radio show so we can keep it free for you. Follow our radio show on Blog Talk Radio and Spreaker. We know that congenital heart defects touch people all over the globe. But remember, my friends, you are not alone. Thank you again for joining us this week. We hope you've been inspired and empowered to become an advocate for the congenital heart defect community. Heart to Heart with Anna, with your host, Anna Jaworski, can be heard every Tuesday at 12 noon Eastern Time. We'll talk again next week. 